the innate part of our culture, which is to be entrepreneurial and hustlers, right? Dynamic and resilient, right? And high achievers, because guess what? It goes back to the bigger picture of the, how, what it means to be Vietnamese American. You take all of the learnings and experiences from corporate life and apply it to your personal business or whatever it is that you're doing on the side. You should be doing that, right? But like you should be, be investing into yourself. So you just got to make it however you got to make it, right? And so, again, I go back to that trip when I was 15 years old and I saw all of that firsthand in terms of what real poverty is yeah. in a third world country versus what poverty is here and what the opportunities are here. My name is Mike Van. And I'm currently the president of Billboard. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? Uh, what I would say is, let's rephrase that question. I think it's, I would answer it as, well, first of all, I would ask myself is, what does it mean to be Vietnamese American? Um, because number one, I was born here. Uh, and number two, uh, because I was born here and I was raised here, um, my experience uh, with that kind of background um, has kind of been dynamic, right? And so I would say the first thing I would say is, is being Vietnamese American is to be dynamic. Um, it is to be uh, versatile. Um, it is to be resilient, um, determined, uh, and I should say determined to achieve, um, but also to have this kind of like sense of responsibility too, um, for having this amazing and tremendous opportunity to be here and to live here in this country, um, that provides just so much opportunity to, to achieve and to succeed and to live a life that's very different than say, you know, a lot of our family members that live in Vietnam or anywhere else on the planet, right? So to me, that's what it means to be, to be uh, Vietnamese American. Now, we, we've had a conversation uh, before about where you grow up in the United States, mm -hmm. a profound difference on who you become. And, you know, I joke around about that with my group of, of friends and- yeah. It's become a running joke, but uh, there are some major differences. And, you know, I know that you have opinions about this and I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely do. So like, you know, just like, so let's go back a bit, right? So all of our parents, when they came to this country, the point of entry was either like Camp Pendleton on the West Coast. And I, I don't even know where on the East Coast or wherever else in the country, right? But some military base. And our parents basically decided to either part ways with their community of people that they came over with you know, to this country or not. And they said, okay, uh, where are we going to go? And my dad, my mom decided to, of all places, settle in Sacramento, California. I understand why they did was because at the time, my dad, obviously, who was in the military in Vietnam and his commanding officer, they, that family decided to go to Sacramento too. So he decided to follow them. But, you know, it's it's interesting when I reflect on my life and I reflect where I am now and how far I've come. And when I talk to my mom about like, you know, why did we choose Sacramento and how like our lives would have been so much more different, I believe, if we would have say, if we would have settled, say, like in New York, right, on the East Coast or something like that. Um, but then at the same time, too, if we would have settled, like, say, in Houston, Texas or wherever, right, like our lives would have been very different. And I think that... Um, I know for, I don't know, I believe this. If definitely if I would have, if we would have settled in like say New York or somewhere on the East Coast like that, um, I often, I, I think my life would have been very different. I think my life probably would have been on another kind of like scale or the outcome would have been, I think maybe amplified a bit. You know? I hang out with a lot of East Coast Vietnamese guys that are out in California doing things um that you just don't see West Coast guys doing. And no. West Coast guys are into other things. And we're going to make generalities here and, and get crucified for it. But I think we should deep dive into this because we talk about this a lot in my group. There's something about the East Coast. And I want to hear from you. And then I'll give you my two cents on the difference it, it makes for I, particularly Vietnamese Americans. And what is it mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, for me, it's 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 
it's not a simple answer. It's a complex one, but I think it's, um, it's attributed to my personal experience in living in New York. Um, not only living, but also traveling to New York consistently, you know, since the very beginning of my career, 20, 25 years ago. Right. And what I will tell you is that it really be didn't become very evident to me until I actually lived there in New York city with everyone else, you know, in humanity who was just trying to make it, you know, in that concrete jungle. But like, even before that, you know, like, again, when I, when, just as simple as like, just noticing a couple of things. One is from a culture and family perspective, like the, the whole notion of blue bloods, right? What's, what does blue blood mean? It means there's, to me, it's families who have either settled and or have existed in this country for multiple generations mm -hmm. who made their wealth, right? Who made their wealth and created their wealth over time by way of real estate and or whatever other types of investments or assets that they've attained that they've acquired and they've retained over a matter of time and multi-generations have benefited from it, right? So, so I've always asked like, well, how do like, you know, how do you, how, how do these like buildings exist with these like last names, you know, attributed to them or these huge parks in New York like, there are, And again, like, and so it was because it's, these families have lived there for many, 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 many years and multiple generations and built their wealth that way. Right. Then from a cultural perspective too, like, for example, you go to Harlem, right. And there was a huge renaissance, obviously, in the early 1900s for Black folks, right? For African Americans who had lived there, had settled there for multiple generations, and they have thrived, right? And they have made it up into the economic food chain in a way where they've succeeded in ways that a lot of people have not, I, I, I believe, don't, don't fully recognize yet, right? But I saw that firsthand. And so in New York, it was like, not so much about, yes, there was one layer in terms of like the color of your skin, and your family, but also from a cultural perspective, in living in New York, you were just given that platform and an opportunity, not given, I said, but that platform and opportunity and scale and amplification of all of that fully existed there so that you could take advantage of that opportunity. Finance, for example, right? New York is the financial capital of the country, if not of the world. And if you've got, if that, if that is true, the amount of money and opportunity that comes from that does not exist anywhere else. And so even if you're peripherally um, exposed to it or directly for that matter, right? You're gonna benefit from that. And if you're hungry and if you're opportunistic and if you are ambitious and you are, you have, you're dynamic and you want to achieve, chances are you're gonna find your way through that maze and succeed, right? So to me, that's what I've seen personally. That's what I attribute it to. And every single person that I know, doesn't matter what color they are, especially if they're born and raised in New York, they say, first and foremost, I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. And they make that dis distinct, very distinct kind of like notion of, if they, and especially if they grew up in the city, they're from New York City specifically, right? And of course, if you're from Queens or Brooklyn or other boroughs or whatever, like they, then they, you know, they also mention that and they're very proud of that, right? And so, you know, for that matter, you know, you take that, the proximity to, to the financial center of the world, the proximity to like a cult, major cultural center, but also education. Yeah. We East Coast education, that. East Coast education is very different, right? From what I've heard and what I've seen, whether that be public or private, in grade school, middle school, high school, obviously in the university as well, it's just different. It's just more developed. It is um, I would say they operate at a higher level. They just do. Yeah. Where in your family's history do you think you picked up the love of the arts? Yeah. Um, it's both definitely my, both of my parents. Um, I'll start with my dad. You know, growing up from as the earliest memories that I have, uh, we've always been around music, always. My dad's always played music in the house. He was also a musician. He played in a band, you know, like my understanding from what my mom was telling me, even like all the way back to like Vietnam, you know, he, my dad actually even told me this story too. He was like, at a very young age, he just wanted to play music. He was just very drawn to music. So he would be playing in like cafes in Vietnam and stuff like that. And he played drums, he played guitar, he played bass, he played piano, he sang like, you know, he would be the, he would be the uncle that would be singing at, you know, 
the weddings, right? Like <laughs> he'd get called up <laughs> to sing with the Vietnamese band, you know, <laughs> like at weddings and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, for the, you know, and so, you know, all the way up to like, you know, like I can have my earliest memories of my dad was playing records. You know, he had the, he had the Technique 1200. He had the huge speakers. He had like the whole band set up in his garage. Like, and I was so just, you know, obviously enamored by it all. And it obviously influenced my year in terms of all the music, all the genres that I love. Um, but it really, you know, it really came from my dad first and foremost. And then on my mom's side, you know, my mom, she was um, just, just a very creative person in general, very resourceful person, just I would imagine as all great Vietnamese mothers and women are, are right? Um, and that's, that's a common trait that I find uh, actually that I've noticed with women from that generation, but they're just, she just was very creative in her own right as it relates to, um, whether it be, you know, reading or writing or, or, or art for that matter, she just always encouraged us to expand our aperture and our awareness of everything out there, you know, beyond kind of like, you know, academics, right? Now, that being said, academics also are very important too, as in any Vietnamese or Asian family household, right? You know, nothing is acceptable be below A's, you know, B's are like whatever, you know, C's are like, you know, like the, it's like death and, you know, nothing short of A's were, were, were acceptable, right? But but from a creative perspective, that that really, really, those two things, like yeah. you know, from my, both my parents, my dad and my mom's side, like, um, you know, encouraging me. And I would also say, just again, also, growing up in Sacramento, California, where, you know, in the early '80s, you know, that was like, you know, hip hop was definitely raging, right? And we grew up in a neighborhood that was really diverse, literally, like every flavor of of ethnic background you can think of. Uh, was on my block and we were all very you know very tight friends we had a whole crew of like kids that were like literally black white latino vietnamese whatever right and and i remember like for example my older brother who's five years older than me like you know he was in a rap group like wow. literally like he was in a rap group he formed a rap group you know and like <laughs> you know there was like b-boy crews and like there is so again, all of those, all of those factors, including, you know, being around my dad, him playing in bands, him, you know, him exposing us to a bunch of music at a very young age is what is what really influenced me in terms of like my love for music, but just for art, art and culture in life. You go to college and you start to dabble within the advertising industry. Yeah, I would say more than dabble. Um, yeah. Becoming president of, of the ad club in, in, <laughs> in college. I can't believe, can't believe you know this. Um, and I don't know where you got that, but you probably, yeah. But anyways, so anyway, so yeah, I, I, I definitely stumbled upon the advertising industry. Uh, I was a business major first and foremost, and I didn't want to take calculus. And I found, you know, accounting at the time to be boring and economics too, for that matter. But now I love those subjects. Um, but so I changed over to communications and I became a PR major and then I didn't want to press, write press releases. Right. So I took an advertising one-on-one class. And in that class, um, you know, you, your first couple chapters of the curriculum, you, you study, you know, campaigns, creative, you study that kind of stuff. And I stumbled upon this, um, in chapter two, where they, we started studying this, one of the greatest commercials that was ever created ever, um, called the Apple 1984 ad. Um, and, um, I discovered that this agency called TBWA Shy Day was the agency, the creative agency, um, that what, made that commercial. What was so creative about that commercial? Um, multiple factors from a pure creative perspective. Uh, it was based off of Orson Welles, like big brother. Right. And in 1984, that's when the Apple Mac, the first Mac was ever launched. So clearly Steve Jobs had his hands in it. Uh, and a creative visionary by the name of Lee Clow, this guy, um, he collaborated with Steve Jobs and they made this commercial. So not only was it visually stunning and, and, and based off of this big brother type of concept, right? But the way that they did it too, like they bought a ton of media time and space during the Super Bowl. It aired during the Super Bowl. It was the most expensive commercial ever produced during that time. Uh, and they spent the most money ever. And it was for Apple, it was a huge bet. You know, if you think about Apple's um, 
where they were as a company and as a brand and as a product that they were launching. There was literally something that was revolutionary that was literally going to change. So that's why it was it was launched in 1984. And the whole idea was like, you know, or the part of the creative and the commercial, if you watch it, right, it's like, you know, this is why 1984 is not going to be like 1984 because of this, the launch of this new really? product. Yeah, it was, it, you know, it was directed by Ridley Scott. Like it was like every box you can think of from a creative and from a cultural impact, from a business impact. Like it literally changed the course of advertising and your and, life. <laughs> and my life because I was like, I looked at that. I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. I never heard of this before. And who's the agency? Oh, that that's the agency. TBWH Day is like, I'm going to work there. That's what I'm going to do. Right. And uh, so went down that path in college, um, got my internship at TBWH Day. They, wow. Their North American headquarters was based in venice um right off of main street in a at a really famous building that was designed by frank Gehry. it's called the binocular building it's still there uh, i think google occupy occupies it i think or someone occupies it but um so I, I got an internship there hustled to get an internship there i did my internship in the binocular building um and it was a free internship drove there two days a week um and what was interesting though is that throughout my college time um all of my closest friends were all either advertising, production, journalism majors. So we were all in the mix, mm. right? Um, all of us, whether that be on the creative side or on the media side of advertising or the production side. And so what started to happen was once I got my internship there, then two of my other, I pulled friends when I was like, you guys got to do internships here. Internships, I'm sorry, internships here. And so we just started bringing more and more friends and doing, they all discovered it and they were like, holy shit, this is amazing. And, um, you know, to the point where by the time I graduated, I got a job there. I started there. And even before me, you know, other friends started getting jobs there too. Who, we all went to college together and we were all either graduating the same class either before, during, or after as well. And literally there was a whole crew of people from Cal State Fullerton from the communications department or major for that matter, who all started their careers at Shai Day, literally. And to this day, I'm very close friends still with all of them. Amazing. And yeah, and so, Shia Day was basically at that time, it was like the last generation, the last great generation of what advertising used to be, right? So think Don Draper, Mad Men, mm -hmm. think all of that from the 60s all the way up into the early 2000s. That I believe, in hindsight, 2020 now, that 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 generation of advertising professionals was the last great generation. Why? Because that was also the time when web 2.0 launched and really started to take a foothold as it relates to advertising, how it influenced advertising, right? So this is pre Google, pre Facebook. This is Friendster. This is Yahoo. This is AOL. Friendster was pre MySpace, mm -hmm. right? So social networks wasn't even a thing. So anyways, from 99 to like Oh three, um, you know, you still had a lot of money being invested into TV, billboard, outdoor, print, all these other traditional forms of advertising and digital was just starting to come into the forefront, right? And so there's that dynamic that's happening at a macro level. And then when you zone into, uh, zoom into to what was happening at Shia Day too, the advertising business models were changing. But also this last great generation I'm talking about, like there were like 600 people at this company, right? And imagine being in a place where there were 600 people who are all young, literally no one more than 30 years old, literally, right? If you're older than 30 at that time, you were considered old in advertising, right? Um, young, diverse. Oh, I shouldn't say diverse. I take that back. No, not diverse. Young good looking educated and eager and just ready to get after it and very creative very creative right across the board um 
in every discipline, right? Because in advertising, you have media, you have account management, you have creatives, copywriting, you have art directors, you have production. There's all these different disciplines. And it was like a, it was like almost like a, like a creative graduate school, right? Wow. Um, and, and so, and so you have that dynamic taking place and all these kind of macro influences and things that are taking place that are like literally world changing and culture changing all happening at the same time. And, and, you know, from there, you know, everyone launched their careers, right. Uh, including myself. Um, and so that was when I was at the agency side, literally stayed there for four years. Um, but also realized that you can't make a lot of money doing what we were doing. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I, during that time I was exposed to media sales and I want to be clear here. This is a niche within a niche within a niche, right? In terms of how small this community is, but how influential as well as lucrative it was. I mean, for example, I worked on the Nissan national account. I worked in media planning. So we would plan all of the creative, where all that creative would run. We would literally tell Nissan where to spend their $200 million budget in media a year. So therefore I was in control at a very young age of a lot of money of which then I would reward that business, award that business to certain media entities, whether that be broadcast TV, outdoor, mm -hmm. or print magazines at the time. And I just distinctly remember always meeting a lot of these people, these salespeople, they would come in super fly, dressed to the nines, their whips were amazing, immaculately you know, manicured from head to toe, very articulate, doing presentations in front of 50 people and asking you for $10 million, right? <laughs> like. I'm like, that's what I want to do. Let's go there. So I did that. So I got into that. I actually, it was it was weird. It was crazy. I actually, it wasn't something that happened overnight. Uh, I actually did like over the course of about a year and a half, I did like maybe 40 interviews. Um, and I finally landed a job after doing a second or like a second series of interviews with the Source magazine. I started in print sales, but it was a dream come true for me. And if you're old enough, like I am, you remember how influential the Source magazine was. Like it was the hip hop Bible. Oh my God. Like you could not tell me anything. So I got the job there. Did you at the time recognize that you're up against a, a different sort of presentation? You had to look a certain way. You had to be a certain type of person. Um, yes, I was very aware of that. But even before, I was aware of that before the 40 interviews I had to go on, right? You know, at that time in advertising, um, it was overwhelmingly white, like 90%. You know, um, from Don Draper in the 60s all the way up into, you know, the early 2000s, right? Um, and uh, because of that, I was very aware of, hey, yeah, there's a, obviously there's a status quo here, but. But what's interesting about advertising, though, is that like because of the creative nature of it, it manifests itself in a way that's kind of different. What I mean by that is like, if listen, if you were idea driven, creative, also hardworking, and all of those things, you could stand out. You could contribute. You could, you could be respected, right? And I saw that in fits and starts here and there, you know, throughout, throughout the industry. Um, yet at the same time too, on the business side of things, yeah, like you had to had a certain level, have a certain level of polish. You had to have that kind of level of refinement. And, you know, we go back to the earlier parts of our conversation around education, exposure, and where you grew up and all those things, you know, clearly I didn't have that, but I got exposed to it. Yeah. when I was around these people. And so I could see like, okay, that's how you operate. And so when I talk about what it means to be Vietnamese American, dynamic, resilient, you know, being able to uh, be a chameleon, right? Like those are the things that helped me. They matter. And not only did they matter for me and they helped me, but that's what gave me the confidence. Literally, because I didn't care that you saw me as someone who was Asian and potentially either inferior or not at your level. I didn't, that didn't, yeah. that didn't affect my confidence or my self-awareness. If anything, it, it drove me, right? It drove me to go even harder, to be like, 
all right, you don't see me that way. All right. Let me prove watch. it. Yeah. I'm going to prove not only prove it, but in time, <laughs> in time, you'll, 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 you'll want to, you'll want to, um, we'll have another conversation and, and you'll see where, where I'm at versus where you're at. How long were you at the source for? I was at the source for three years. And then from that point on, I had a series of other sales jobs and just, um, but I will tell you that every single job that I had, um, at all these other companies, they all aligned with my personal kind of like interests too. Because in my view, from a from a from a business perspective, but also from a sales philosophical perspective, like for me, I couldn't sell anything or be a yeah. part of something that what didn't interest me, right? Or wasn't a part of my personal interest. So music, gaming, tech, um, those were the things that were interesting to me. And so as a result of that, they all. In heavily influenced where the brands that I would be attracted to that I would want to work for. So it included the source it included ESPN. It included MySpace, which is tech. It included gaming, which was EA. It included, you know, music again in tech, which was Pandora. And then obviously ultimately where I am right now at Billboard. So how did you get to Billboard? Um, I was contacted by a former boss that I had who was very influential in my career, uh, who was also notorious in the business, <laughs> uh, good or bad. Um, but um, I, I also I also I worked at Complex as well. Um, and he was my he was my boss at Complex back in like 2007, when I lived in New York, New York. And um, he basically contacted me out of the blue and was like, hey, there's something that we're trying to do different here at this company. Um, and I'd love for you to come on and join me. You know, I, uh, at that time I just had my kids. So I was like literally on like paternity break. Um, and through, you know, a series of meetings and, 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 and conversations over a six month period, um, I decided to join um, just as like a head of sales for them on the, on the West coast. Um, that was back in 2018. And from that point on until now, I pretty much just rose through the ranks a bit. Um, and good fortune was bestowed upon me and, you know, through time and hard work and kind of being in the right place at the right time and a mixture of other things. Um, that's how I became president. When you land at billboard, your head of sales, what, what exactly are you selling at that point? So in our business, what we call 360 programs, right? A 360 approach, which includes everything from live events, custom content, original content, um, digital media, which means everything from pre-roll video to the banners that you see to stuff that you see in social that like are in feed and whatnot. Um, it's those capabilities that are what we're selling. So we would work with Fortune 500, Fortune you know, 100 companies, every blue chip marketer you can think of and think of all the campaigns that they launch, right? Based on the products that they're promoting or whatever wares they're trying to sell. You know, we have an audience at Billboard. Um, we are music obviously focused. We like to say, you know, think of ourselves as the most, you know, trusted and influential brand in music on the planet. Um, and if music is a part of your marketing, you know, acumen or vertical that you want to pursue, we have that audience and we have a lot of content that aligns with that. Now, when you're wearing that head of sales at Billboard the first year, running an organization like Billboard as a CEO requires many more hats than just sales. Were you mm -hmm. thinking about any of that when you were doing that that first year? You're like, okay, I can see other parts of becoming upper management that I have to learn. Or yes. is it something you just kind of like you knew you, you did a lot more, you did other jobs and you kind of have an understanding of a business model and then you just organically grow into? Or is it like you, you're missing 80% of what it means to be a CEO and you're having to slowly learn all of it. Like yeah. what, how did, how did it work? It was both actually. And it also, you know, that thinking, so it was both to answer your question directly. One, I was, when I was hired to become, you know, head of sales, I was myopically focused on that function of the business, right? Which is to drive about 70 to 80% of the total revenue that came in for the company that was direct right? Because there's other forms of revenue that come in, whether that be through licensing or e-commerce or whatever that, 
had nothing to do with my team and what we had to do. So I was myopically focused on that my first year. Yet at the same time, too, very aware of all these other facets of the business, not only from a business perspective, but from a content perspective, too, because there's a full editorial mm -hmm. team domestically and globally that create content for Billboard and for the brand, right? So, so I was aware of those aspects of the business, but I wasn't focused on it in my first year. And then through time, as we continued to perform and as the team continued to perform, that's when I became more and more exposed to that, to those, to those parts of the business. Now, what I will say is prior to coming to Billboard, um, and this goes all the way back to like, say 2008, you know, all the other jobs that I had previous to that all exposed me and prepared me for not only that self-awareness of understanding a P&L, a balance sheet, an income statement, all of those things that are like kind of fundamental to, to a corporation, to a fully functioning business. Um, but I also like, not only did I get exposure, but it was like a lot of like grad school level type of learning that I had, yeah. for example, when I worked at Electronic Arts, publicly traded company, $30 billion in top line revenue at the time, multi multinational, had quarterly earnings calls that we would all tune into and listen to, right? Um, and, you know, that was like, for example, a huge marker in my career as it relates to just really learning and understanding, you know, a PL, you know, from a corporate perspective, what is OPEX? You know, what is contribution profit? What is all these kind of aspects of, 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 the, of, the, of the balance sheet that, that, that mattered? And interestingly enough, like per my curiosity, as well as just um, how my like brain and life works, you know, back in 2010, 2011, I started to invest heavily into real estate and create my own LLCs, create my own S-Corps, create my own kind of like side businesses where I was just fully focused on creating passive income on the side in addition to whatever I was oh. doing full-time with earned income, right? And so that was something that was really, really important for me to also just learn on my own and, and, and to achieve. And that really came, came from like a lot of like the entrepreneurial side of my parents. You know, both my parents are entrepreneurs. They weren't college educated. They raised, you know, children here to be successful. And a big part of that was being entrepreneurial and understanding how to, um, how to manage your, your finances, you know, at, at home. And, you know, a huge marker for me was also in my personal life was like, you know, at that time when I worked at MySpace, you know, they, they were owned by News Corp before they got sold to this other company that Justin Timberlake was a part of at, at the time. And they were laying off a lot of people. We're talking like thousands of people. And I was there for that. I didn't get laid off. In fact, they retained me because I was a profit center as well as a revenue generating function of the business. So they needed to keep us on. But it was scary as hell. Yeah. You could see the writing right? on the wall, maybe. Well, not only that, I mean, it goes back to the saying, right? It's like if you're a fully, if you're an employed person that works for a company or a corporation and you have no, equity or you have no other means of income you're one check away from homelessness or poverty <laughs> one because once you get fired or you let get, you get let go there's no money coming in that thing stops and if you're lucky enough to get a severance package that maybe will last you maybe if you're lucky three months right so back then in 2010 that was when i was like about to get married obviously getting really serious and thinking about having you know a family and all those things and as just the confluence of factors and influences of everything that happened in my life prior to that, I like literally freaked out. And I was like, um, yeah, that's not happening to me. <laughs> and, and only that. So, so that started my journey of developing this whole other side of my life, which was uh, investing into, into assets, specifically into real estate that would create passive income for myself and my family in a way where should the very unfortunate thing happen where either I get laid off or my wife gets laid off or I get fired because that can happen too these days. Like anything can happen, right? Like that uh, we would be fully prepared to take on that, 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 that brunt of, of, of impact and be completely fine. You take all of the learnings and experiences from corporate life, right? And if, and apply it to your personal business or whatever it is that you're doing on the side or whatever, you should be doing that, right? Like you should be, you should make the time for that. You should be investing into yourself. So that's why, you know, like, and so I don't know. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I think that 
again, it goes back to the bigger picture of the top of our conversation around the whole, all, how, what it means to be Vietnamese American. That this is another point of, yep. of what it means to be Vietnamese American is that the innate part of our culture, which is to be entrepreneurial and hustlers, right? Dynamic and resilient, right? And high achievers, because guess what? In Vietnam, you don't have that opportunity. There is no 401k. There is no IRA. There is no healthcare system, right? You just got to make it however you got to make it, right? And so, again, I go back to that trip when I was 15 years old and I saw all of that firsthand in terms of what real poverty is yep. in a third world country versus what poverty is here and what the opportunities are here. I took it and ran with it, man. That's the advantage of being second generation immigrants. You know, we just have that advantage. We see how tough the the, the previous generation and the current motherland, you know, it's mm -hmm. just like a, a different, it, it, it energizes you in a different way. It does. It does. And I will tell you this, I, and again, not taking anything away from any of your other guests or, you know, anyone's experience as it relates to life and how being straddling both cultures has affected them and made them feel either, you know, deficient or not confident or anything for that, because that's very real. I mean, that's, for example, my older brother dealt with that, right? Um, not taking anything away from that at all. But I will tell you, for me, myself, I never, I use that as a, as a, as fuel. I use that as a super, as part of my superpower. I did not let it become a detriment to my, to my being, to my awareness or to my confidence. Yeah. I, I probably am in the camp of your older brother. I, it, it did affect me mm -hmm. in a negative way, but I think that when you're like the younger sibling and you see like an older sibling be affected, go through way, it. You're yeah. Like, no, 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 fuck no. I'm not being affected like that. I mean, there's a hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent, man. And you know, my older brother in, in, in your generation bore the brunt of that. And yeah. I completely get it, dude. Like I, I really do. And so that's why, you know, when I go back to your question around, you know, are we going to see that kind of representation? Um, you know, and again, I'll say more so from my generation and yeah. younger than your generation, for sure. And I think it almost has something to do with very nuanced, specific timing things too. Like mm -hmm. your brother and I probably did not really get to bond with hip hop the way you did. And I think the messaging in hip hop is something that sort of your brother and I probably missed. And, and, and the messages in hip hop is very empowering for underprivileged communities and you can rise to the top uh being scrappy and you can you can hustle your way where i think we missed that boat a little bit because you know i don't i don't bond to hip-hop the way uh that you might you're, you're the younger generations you know yeah. um I, I don't know that's just a guess that i have i think that's part of it again man i, I think it's for us to for us to say it was one a singular thing yeah. i think i think would be myopic in scope i think that um i, I think it's a confluence of things for sure but certainly, you know, and also depending upon like where it, where, where you were in your life, how you grew up, who you grew up with, like all these things, all like, these they all things really, matter. really, they all really, really matter. But I think again, for just from my experience and for what I've seen, you know, but that's again, I, this is just me, how I am. Like the music that your generation, that my older brother were, were listening to during that time. So for example, right. Hip hop was definitely hip hop popping off, but so was new wave. So think like, right. Like, the Smiths and Morrissey and The Cure New and Order. Depeche Mode and New Order and like that whole genre right there, for example, like which is also very influential to me, but also influential with my brother. I mean, look at his if you look at his if you look at his playlist, right? Like it's like it's like yeah, there's some hip hop, but then there's all this other stuff. You know so what I mean? From like yeah. the '80s, like that literally was the definition of it wasn't even yacht rock. Like it was like literally like that whole new wave, right? <laughs> And I know you had that hairstyle. I know you were rocking those clothes too, dude. Right? Like, 100%. Right? 100%, 100%. So, so I get, I get that. I see that. Like, but that's what also made me super dynamic in that regard. Right? Um, but not so much with my brother in, in your generation. And what I would also say, and if I mentioned this too, like, you know, I, I grew up in Hawaii as well. So when my parents got divorced, we moved to Hawaii when I was eight years old. My oh, older man. brother was 13, 14. My younger brother was six. And we not only did we grow up, we moved to Hawaii. We moved to a part of Oahu that was super remote. 
like country, country, country. How long were like, you? Even the about? locals, even the locals call it country. Like country. When I'm telling you country, it was country, right? How long so, were you there for? I mean, I I lived there from the time I was eight to eighteen, so ten years. Oh, wow, that's and my cool. brothers, my brothers and my mom lived there even longer. So my older brother graduated from high school there. And then after high school, he went to the Air Force and he came back to Hawaii and he lived there throughout his 20s. Why? Because he went to UH, University of Hawaii, graduated when he was 28 after the Air Force. Same thing with my younger brother. He stayed there all the way through high school, graduated high school, went to UH as well, and then lived there in his throughout his 20s as well. And including my mom, she lived there the entire time. I was the only one that didn't go back after high school. Right. Um, and so, so as a result of that, that too, that is a whole other chapter of our life. Yeah. <laughs> that there's really influenced certain, us. There's a certain empowerment at, in Hawaii as well, because it's all Asian Americans, basically. It's 98% Asian American. It was the reverse. reverse. See, it was the reverse of what everyone from our generation or older or younger experienced in the, what we call in the mainland, right? It was reverse racism. And this is formative and for you, your formative years, eight to 18. 10. They would also even, it was also racism within Asians and Polyne, like, yeah. if you were Japanese or Chinese or Filipino and you weren't Hawaiian or you weren't Samoan or you weren't a mix of things or you weren't local enough or whatever it was, like, they would discriminate against you too, right? Like, so, like, so there was that whole crazy sub dynamic. But then the overwhelming thing was if you were white, oh man, You're especially fucked. you were fucked. And not only that, especially where, where we grew up, which is the west side of Oahu, which is uh, a tiny little beach town called Makaha, which is a famous beach break because that was like literally where a lot of the surfers from the 50s from the mainland from Huntington Beach, like literally mm. came and learned how where to surf. That beach break is, was my backyard. That's where I grew up, literally, dude. <laughs> I swear to God, I got to make wow. this up. So like, so anyways, you know, being exposed to music and culture there too. So this is full on, full blown, hardcore Hawaiian local culture, surf culture. Then not only that Hawaiian and reggae music on top of that. Mm. And then on top of that, from a race dynamic perspective, full blown reverse racism. It's so crazy that you think, I mean, I, I get it. We had a long conversation about growing up in New York. But growing up in Hawaii is a, is a, is a, is a very unique superpower for Asian American children. Yeah, um, I agree. I, yeah, I have another friend who grew up in Hawaii as well. They, uh, their family, the Lay family runs the Pig and the Lady. They, they started the Pig and the Lady mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Yeah. Huge fan of the Pig and the Lady. Every time I go to Hawaii, I, oh, we eat there, 100%. Shout yeah. out to Pig and the Lady. Shout, Shout out to your guys' oxtail pho. Shout out to all of your all of your dishes. For real. Yeah. So good. O Obama, when he vacations there, they that's where they go. Uh pig and lady. They close off like this. They have a banquet hall uh, upstairs and they, they serve dinner for Obama and the and his his clan. A in any case, Anderson, you there, there's a certain confidence that kids growing up in that Oahu sort of Hawaii backdrop. Mm -hmm. You can't take it away. It's like kids that grew up in the nope. 66 in L in L.A., the Pasadena, Alhambra, San Gabriel Valley area. It's the, kind of the same. They're like they're inside Asian. Uh, there's inside American culture, but they're kind of living in their own confident bubble. bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. A couple of reasons. So broader is you are the dom. Like you're not. You're not being discriminated against right. in the way that, that Asian kids would hear, right? So that's number one. So there's a certain level of pride. You know that, okay, these are my these people look like me. And not only that, we're all but we're also hyper comp competitive competing with each other too. So in Hawaii, growing up during that time, right? Also, like fighting was a really big thing. So you learn how to get down. Wow. Fighting. And none would you fight, like, you know, my brothers and I like we'd fight like Big Hawaiian dude, like big, like, and I played football too. My younger brother played football. We were going up against like 250 pound Samoan kids. Like we didn't care. Right. So that, that right there in itself, like you yeah. learned fighting culture is a really big thing in Hawaii. 
really big thing. So that's why like a lot of great fighters come like BJJ and like yeah. MMA fighters. Why? They come from Hawaii. Like look at BJ Penn. Like it just it's and not not only the guys but the girls too. <laughs> like <laughs> like everyone knew how to get down, right? So 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 that was a really big and I think that was a big part of like, you know, the kind of confidence and and and, and it was a huge part of that you know, Hawaiian and local culture, but also being exposed to water sports, being very comfortable in the water, surfing, bodyboarding, body surfing, spear fishing, fishing, snorkeling, scuba diving, being very comfortable and connected to the water and respecting something that is beyond your control. That's so powerful. I mean, I almost drowned like three times as a kid. You know what I mean? Like, look, but look, look at Obama, for example. Why do you think he's part of the swagger that he has? Yeah. That dude body surfs with the best of them. Right. And not only that, he's, Half black, half white, right? Had to deal po- with poly hyphenated, whatever yeah. it is you want to call. He went to the best high school in Hawaii, which is Punahou. Mm-hmm. Literally the best school, the elite school, right? Um, and then he ups and then goes to Occidental College. And then after that, and then, you know, the rest of his life and his career. And so I identify a lot with Obama, yeah. 100%. Yeah. Because the way, when you read his books, um, for example, Letters to My Father, like he documents a lot of that time where he, when he grew up in Hawaii. That was our time. That was my time. When I think about music before the last, I don't know, five, 10 years with this hip hop today for me is very difficult to digest the way it's, you know, that's it's different. It's just different. But I'm sure the kids today um, appreciate that they're hip hop today. And they, they're like, oh, you're just old. You don't understand. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. But at the same time, was music better? Back in the day, uh, I, I'm not. I'm gonna say no. It's, and I'm gonna say, uh, I'm gonna say no, because here's why, right? It's just different. Music, just like any major cultural entity or creative force, is forever changing, evolving, and will continue to do that and be that forever. You know, like. I'll use, for example, my dad, whenever I would listen to hip hop or listen to music when I was, you know, younger, my dad clearly did not understand it. He didn't understand the word. He didn't understand why bass was so turned, turned up. He didn't understand why they were cursing all the time. He didn't understand a lot of things. Right. But then when he would play his music, not only Vietnamese music, you know, but more importantly, the American music that he listened to, like classic rock, that kind of stuff that that made sense to him. You know what I mean? He and liked his that. parents were probably putting that down too no i mean dude like exactly so my point is it's a generational thing it's a because music is a forever evolving cultural creative dynamic and not only that you layer in how it's consumed now versus and how Mm -hmm. not only consumed but how it's discovered music discovery is very very different and that's a really big thing right now that's a huge subject that's being uh, not only contemplated and discussed in, in in the music business but just like it's a it's a very real thing like you take music discovery on TikTok. You literally have artists now that emerging artists that are breaking music, launching their careers just on TikTok alone. Right? And it's partly because, you know, you've got a lot of Gen Z and Gen, Gen Alpha spending a lot of time on there, but as they spend a lot of time and then as they discover music on that platform where by way of sharing, you know, with their peers or with their social networks, um that is influencing music business as a general in terms of like how things are getting monetized, how they're being ranked, how uh, how record labels and established artists and business managers and ecosystems of people around these artists are maneuvering and how they are making it known in terms of like how artists can be discovered and blow up. You know, look at Doja Cat, look at Lil Nas X, look at um, amazing stories. Doja exactly. Cat story. It's amazing. Can you, amazing. Can you talk a little bit about it? I mean, I know it, but I want to hear it because I want other people to, to understand what, what the implications of going from your bedroom to the world stage, with especially yeah. with Doja Cat. You know, it's no one can see it coming, right? It's from a business perspective. I would say that the, the way that music entities like the labels whether they be traditional labels independent ones or anything for that matter it's 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 shifting definitely shifting and influencing the way that they do business and the models that they have right from a from an from a 
from an artist perspective, if I'm an artist, I mean, this is a golden age, in my opinion, where you've never been more empowered and the tools you have at your disposal to make it and defining make it is different to everyone, but to superstardom, whether that be money, fame, consumption of your content that you create, your own personal brand. You know, I follow Russ. Do you know who Russ is? I've, I've never heard of Russ. Yeah, Russ is a, he's a hip hop artist. Um, he's independent fully. Uh, and he's been embraced, you know, by, by, by fans as well as other hip hop artists who, you know, who are traditionalists in the, in the culture where his business acumen is on point. He makes more, way more money. And he, he literally puts it out there in his, to his audience, to the social channels. Like, Hey, I'm an independent artist. I sell out, I sell out on tours and I make, you know, my cut of, 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 of the revenue that comes in is greater than say an artist who signs to a traditional yeah. label, right. Or contract is just way more different. Now I want to be clear from my point of view, I'm agnostic as it relates. I'm just an observer in all of this, right. This is just what I'm seeing across the board and sure. As a signed artist, can you make it to fit, you know, to fame and bit and, 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 and fortune? Absolutely. Right. But I would say to, to, you know, as it relates to, what I'm seeing now in terms of trends and whatnot, like as an artist, you're never more empowered ever, ever. Yeah. And, and let's break it down. The reason why this is, there's a major difference in the models is I think as a signed artist, you're relying on the tools and the mechanism that labels have had for the last 50 years, a hundred years. They, they do all the marketing, they put the packaging together, they put you in the studio with the producer and they do all of that. Now, as an independent artist, you're doing all that yourself or you're hiring your own team to do that and you're putting out the risk of your own money. And so will in the long run labels exist much longer or is that, do you think that it's on its way out or will it always be both ways of doing business with the labels or independent? I think it's gonna be both. But the, the labels are never going to go away. Their their models could shift and change and evolve and all of that. But as business entities, they will always be there. Um, now, is there a 5% chance that something else so disruptive could come in and just cause them to change their name or rebrand or, or merge, you know, um, with other major labels? Yeah. I mean, that's that's happened in the past. Absolutely. But do I think that they'll ever go away? No. Do I? Th and then on the independent side that, yeah, that will, if anything, that's only going to grow and become even more vibrant. Right. I think also when you layer in, when you layer in web three financed by decentralized finance and cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. underpinned completely by blockchain technology, manifested as kind of like the 1.0 version of ownership by through NFTs and, and other cryptocurrencies, that's when things are going to get really See, interesting. That's what I'm <laughs> like, talking about because yep. right now the difference between being signed and doing it yourself independently is probably the amount of money that you can use from the studio side, right? So the studio will put the money out and they'll lock you in. And if you're doing it independently, you have to kind of like be scrappy. If you come from a good family, yeah, you, you have money, bootstrap it. bootstrap it. But that Web3 thing is going to change the face of all of that leveraging. Yeah. And not only in music, but just content. Everything. Literally, it's what is Web3? Web3, from my understanding, is basically ownership, right? Individuals, literally down to the individual, be able to own their stake, their data, they're everything in Web3, right? Supplanted by blockchain technology. From a currency perspective, cryptocurrencies to be able to exchange value, right? NFTs in terms of, and, and blockchain technology to, to prove ownership, right? Um, and so, yeah, like imagine being an artist and launching your album as an NFT that you can sell for one ETH on OpenSea. And you only mint 250 of those NFTs. Game changer. That's direct revenue to, yes. to, the, to the artist and direct ownership to the fan. Now, the X factor here is, and what we're seeing right now as it relates to the onset of, of, the, of the crypto winter is it's still dollar denominated. 
right? Everything goes back to the dollar right now. And as we saw, when interest rates increased, what happened? All of that deleveraging started to happen. And so that's why you saw the crash in crypto yep. because you had all of these people, institutions, whoever, whatever, anyone that was invested in crypto was so over leveraged that went, as soon as the interest rates came up and it became expensive to, to borrow out. money, yeah, dude, <laughs> got wiped out. So it's going to be interesting to see once interest rates go back down and inflation gets tamed and all those kinds of things, how it's going to affect the entire crypto market. I think concurrently, again, I'm still not still like blockchain. It doesn't change blockchain te technology. The the history of, of Billboard, we've talked about this, uh, you know, it started out as, you know, promoting fairs and, and festivals and, and different, you know, public uh, events. And then it, the morphing of it, 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 it grew into this sort of machine and but to see a Vietnamese face that's running it today it, the the enormous amount of pride that I have because I'm in your brother's generation it, it, it's unbelievable I mean it really is and um I'm so excited to to really put this episode out because it because it has implications not just in the United States it has implications around the world about having somebody at that level, right? Thank you for sharing that. When when I when I became president, you know, I, I had I did not I didn't fully appreciate, I think, and not in a bad way, but it's more like from an awareness as well as just like um impact perspective, the impact that it was going to make. And when I hear, you know, details and background, you know, from folks like you, from your generation too, especially, but also from across the board, from a lot of, you know, colleagues, friends, just random people who have, who, who have all kind of like the said, said the same thing in terms of like how impactful it is for them and what it means to them. You know, one I would say is I'm, I'm, I'm deeply humbled, really, truly. I'm, I'm very appreciative. Um, I'm, I'm honored. Um, I am, um, there's just a confluence of emotions and just thoughts and ideas that come to mind where, um, you know, I will tell you that it, if anything, it's, it's fuel and, and even further energy that I, that I receive, that I get, that I use to, to get through all of the, all of the uh, responsibilities and, and, and kind of like, you know, impact that I know that I'm going to make, but also um, I want to be able to use it for good, you know? Uh, and if I can, impact anyone's day or, or, or life or thoughts around, um, Hey, everything from not to sound corny, like, Hey, you can do it too. This is very possible to, Hey, if this is something that you just needed today to get you through today, you know, or tomorrow or whatever it is that I'm, I'm happy to be that person. Um, and you know, I know that, that, that this is all, it's all, it's all fleeting. Like it, it can, it can be gone tomorrow. And so, you know, I, I, it's precious, you know, I, and I, and I precious in a way where I feel like there's so much responsibility that comes along with it. But at the same time too, I don't want it to let it be such a burden on me and my life, my personal life. Right. But also at the same time too, I'm so proud and I'm excited too, at the same time in terms of like, not only what we're going to be able to do now together, but also where it can go. And I will also definitely need to say this too, which is, it's not just me, you know, I'm not self-made, you know, um, there are many, many people that have influenced and helped me along the way, but not only that, but also currently now, right? And I will, I will say, you know, the team that I have at Billboard, I'm very, very, very lucky to have the team that I have because that team consists of a very diverse group of people, but more importantly, women. I'm the only dude on my executive team. Wow. Literally. Amazing. Amazing. There are there are six or seven women who are senior vice presidents or have chief titles on the team here at Billboard who very much impact the course and the performance of our business and our brand. Literally. Um, and I'm very proud and happy to say that I am the only guy. Literally. We're all, we are we are hiring a new senior vice president of sales and brand partnerships. He starts on Monday. He's also Filipino of diverse background. 
to replace my old role, but he and I are going to be the only dudes or only guys that are <laughs> literally on this team. Right. And so shout out to the team at billboard. Um, uh, and I'm so proud to be working alongside them, uh, and to head on this journey together, um, to make, you know, some, make, make some real impact, not only here in the United States, but also globally, um, in music and, and in culture. That's amazing. And, you know, since we're in shout outs, I want to shout out our friend, our Sissy, who introduced you and I. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sissy, for the introduction. Thank you, Sissy. Yeah, it's amazing. And I, I wanted to also say that uh, when I think about your role as president at Billboard, it it's it's like this. It, it goes beyond that. You, you're a young person, you're a young man. And to be in a position as the president of Billboard right now, that's not where you're going to end up it, because life is mm -hmm. long and you're going to have several more iterations of leadership positions that are far beyond uh, the billboard position, um, you know, because I've just watched a lot of Netflix documentaries on different <laughs> leaders that that, you know, in, in the art spaces. Uh, and so I know I know I just know that the trajectory of your influence and your uh, fingerprints on um, Asian American history uh, will be far reaching. And I look forward to that sort of study. And I look forward to um, that history that, that, you know, that you're going to shape alongside with uh, so many other Asian Americans out there. No, I appreciate that for real. Um, and I recognize that as well. And I mean, that's the plan, right? To keep going yeah. and to go, then, not only to keep going, but to keep going far and wide and deep. And so that, you know, I can utilize this um, this whole experience to uplift and empower other folks that look like you and I, or not, right? They're just just anyone who just wants to who wants to achieve and who wants to do impactful things in life, and also to be have to have a dynamic and positive and and, and fruitful life, right? Those are things that are important to me, and um, and also you know, kind of selfishly too. You know, my hope is that you know when my children get older and they see this <laughs> in some sort of you know shape form or fashion um that that they'll be that they can say wow you know like my dad did this and absolutely and it inspired them because that's exactly what my parents did for me you know uh and and that's a whole other podcast that we can talk about too but yeah that, that that's what they did for me so hopefully i can do that for them wonderful hopefully around uh the next time we can get back uh, on the podcast billboard um award show or uh <laughs> hope to get on get back on with you soon 100 percent, ken you know anything that you need uh i'm here and i'm happy to also introduce you to other very dynamic interesting high achieving uh individuals who you i know you haven't met yet who i know are hyper creative hyper successful hyper influential um who would I think be very interested in having a conversation with you for sure. Would love that. Mike Van, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Crystal Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts. Thanks again for listening.